paper is a follow-up to a presentation that I had in 4S conference at Tokyo, which is the Society for Social Studies and Sciences. And uh, uh, it's based on a paper that I'm going to publish. The topic is a society technology product change and responsibility. And I'm going to briefly review the history of science and technology studies um, to just uh, because I'm going to use it as a foundation for the model that I am proposing. And the model that I'm proposing would be an organic feedback model. One of the questions that I want to be discussed after my discussion is the validity of this proposal and the merit of this proposal. So I want to hear your critical um, views about uh, the, this, uh, the merit of this framework com competing with the existing one. So, okay, so I just wanted to declare what is my intentions. So uh, let's, uh, let's read this and think a little bit about uh, these, uh, a couple of sentences. I've selected a few sentences and uh, I want you to look at its rhetorical positioning of technology. Uh, technology is the engine, the humanities are the steering wheel and the brakes. And at first I had a lot of these with the references but I didn't want to make my talk longer than it, than it is already. But look at this, technology is the engine, so there is an engine, um, or like the horsepower, and humanities are steering wheel and brakes, uh, so it's like a, a car analogy. Uh, technology is an inherent democratizer, this is another, from another scholar. And um, so look at this, this technology here is like a, I call it independent value. Now, let's, uh, so let me, like I finished my talk about going back to the validity of these sentences, or the level of validity of these sentences. So, uh, in technology and society studies, they have had a number of different um, uh, frameworks. One of them has been the strong social constructivism, which basically you can summarize as uh, avoiding the reference to actual character of technology. So basically, uh, the follower of followers of this school and also the social construction of science, they think that uh, um, basically the, the technology is socially constructed and that's it. They don't want to give uh, any credit to the nature of the technology in their analysis of the social interrelation with the technology. Then we have social shaping of the technology and you know, if you want to actually read the detail with references, it's in the paper. Uh, social shaping of the technology distinguishes between uh, social and technical knowledge, but they, you know, the, the followers of this, this basically a school of analysis of society and technology, they also consider uh, the nature, they consider the technical parameters as part of the, the determinants of the trajectory. So from my scientific point of view, the social shaping of the technology or the my social constructivism um, considers more variables and it's, it's let, admitting that technology is influencing the trajectory of the society as a system. And then, uh, you know, after these two movements became criticized and, um, you know, discussed, then actor network theory that uh, some of you may be familiar with, actor network theory says, uh, okay, let's consider a symmetry between the technologies and human actors, and human and non-human actors that are part of the society. So they are close to mild social constructivism. They say, okay, society um, involves people, and also it involves technologies, and these technologies are also influencing the trajectory of people. And, uh, you know, you're familiar with that famous paper that Latour wrote about the, um, the door closer, how it changes the behavior of people. It's just um, a literature that lets the technology to be um, like what Latour calls symmetrical and Law calls um, you know, um, more symmetrical, um, generalized symmetry, to consider both human and non-human actors as active members of the analysis. And like, I learned from, and you'll see that I have learned from all of these uh, things, and uh, the, the things that we're learning is that technology and society are in an interrelationship. Now what is, what, what is exactly the role of technology? So all of these things are uh, not my contribution, the references are in the paper. Uh, technology has enabled the society to move from a situation where 80% uh, of people were involved in agriculture to a society that about 10% of the people are involved in agriculture. Uh, 
and that's the, the fact that Daniel Bell has mentioned, Castells has mentioned it, Bender has mentioned it in you know uh, his book, and they're saying that okay, that's for sure this is something that technology has done for us. So ignoring the technology as a variable is um, not. So the, basically, the, accepting the, the, the role for technology in the trajectory of society is against the strong uh, social constructivist approach. Um, so, but we see this kind of technology uh, determining uh, roles. Now, uh, what are the social consequences of the technology exactly? So, did, uh, is there any study that tells us exactly how technology influences the society? How technology, for example, changes you know the the proportion of the people who are working in um, agriculture, for example. And the first uh, attempt to include technology in the analysis of the social trajectory is by Marx. Marx. Uh, argues that people do not establish their conditions of life. And actually he says that status depends on the material condition necessary for mode of production. So although um, it's, it's very, it sounds very technological determinist way of saying it, but it gives a lot of weight to technology. It says actually it is the technology that determines the, 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 the structure uh, of the society and the way that the workforce is organized. The mode of production is organized. And there are a lot of other uh, approaches to giving technology some weight. Uh, so I just went back up to Marx. Um, so when we look at the impact of you know, the, the current li literature about the, the modern technology and the social change, we see that some writers emphasize the benefit um, of the technology for society. Some uh, see it as an evil, coercive force that is you know, attacking the social life, and we have a nostalgia of the past when modern technology wasn't there. And some simply consider technology as an enabling factor that, you know, gives some possibilities to people for a specific ends. So these are the three genres that we see um, in the explanations that uh, we have for the relationship between technology and society. Now, uh, the formation of these consequences, we want to dig further and find out now, can we find an explanatory description going further than exploratory things of saying that all technology and society are related? Can we have more precise and explanatory descriptions? And uh, yes, we have had some explanatory description. Description, for example, Winner and other people in his school have been saying that political attributes are inscribed in the products when they are designed and built, which basically is saying that when you're deciding that we are going to invest in this field of knowledge and understand that, uh, how we can create the next thing, we are mobilizing the social resources. And at that time is the time that the political impact of the technology is inscribed into it. So basically, um, they are saying that it's not random. Technologies are invented, designed, and arranged to have a particular social effect. Uh, that is, at first, just look at that sentence. Technologies are invented, designed, or arranged to have a particular social effect. I think it is obvious because we don't have technologies for no reason. So this is one of the assumptions that I'm going, you know, you don't develop a technology just for nothing. Although it may have destructive results, but when it is developed, it has intended results in it. A given device can be designed and built in, a such, in such a way that it produces a certain set of consequences. So when, yes, when you create the internet, you want it to have packet switching capabilities and call tolerance and so forth. It doesn't mean that it will only be used with your intended result or intended direction, but it certainly is developed with some intentions. Now, however, their adoption sometimes requires the creation and maintenance of particular social conditions want to you know, produce routers, then you need electronic manufacturers, so, so you mo mobilize a, a lot of technologies to be able to produce the kind of technology that you want. Now, mechanisms that by which technology embody values, uh, so basically, we, can, we, should, we cannot claim that, oh, because there are ends to a technology, for sure they will have some values that relate to them, then we have to identify what are those mechanisms. And these mechanisms are a process of making decisions regarding the allocation of capital. So basically, that, you know, if you want to have a factory, 
It doesn't happen just by accident. Investors, researchers, R&D, they have to mobilize their resources, including time, energy, and money, for a technology to create. So it's not just a magic thing that the technology gets some value. Some people with some specific intentions to do specific things create a technology. Selection of particular technology by market mechanisms is the other part. So you, you may have a lot of different technologies, and not all of them will survive. The digital Darwinism, or basically the evolution of the market, will kill some of them, and some of them will, uh, will, uh, will flourish. And that's another the social deterministic impact on the evolution of the technology. Therefore, those technologies that don't produce the, the, the value that the society is expecting will automatically be killed. So we have this filter here that influences the result. Many of these decisions are not technological and scientific. And this is, you know, winner has highlighted, and I want to highlight, that these decisions about what technology we will invest in is not a scientific question. If you spend your money to produce guns, or you spend your money to produce drugs, or produce MRI machines, this is not a scientific question. How you build your MRI machine is a scientific question, but if you will mobilize your resources to produce that specific product, it's not a scientific question. And the people who make those decisions are not scientists. Or even if they are scientists, they are not in the role of a scientist when they make that decision. Okay. So, uh, and there are a lot of other mechanisms that the society uh, embeds its values into them, um, into its structure, laws um, for health and for uh, greenness of the environment, um, uh, and uh, uh, social, uh, basically other laws in the society determine the direction of the society. But, and once a method of production uh, or method of doing things is widely used, then that becomes the standard and everybody else must do it. So if you start, if you created your own new protocol for, for internet communication, your or inter network communication, you will be doomed because everybody else is using TCP IP. So once TCP IP goes above the threshold of application, then after that, it's not a technical decision. If you, if you prove that your protocol is more efficient than TCP IP protocol, it's not going to be mobilization in the society and a lot of investment in that direction already done. So it's a, um, it's a system with memory. It's not just a system with you know, current status and making decisions based on the, the scientific values. There may be many solutions when dealing with a problem and then the choice between these solutions is also a social issue and technical codes become part of the fabric of the society, the protocols and standards. Now, social researchers, okay, so this was a review of the past. Now, what is my solution? When we look at what has been done in the past, there has been a chase for causes. Uh, after the introduction of a pro product, you will see some changes. Or if you look at the introduction, into introduction of a product, you always can find a social event before that. Now, if you look at a social event, you always can find an introduction of a product before that. So there's always possible for you in chain of causality to go back and then you stop at some time. You either stop at the time of uh, introduction of a product or you stop at the time of introduction, you know, a social event. And by that choice, you are either positioning yourself as a technological determinist or a social constructivist by saying that, oh, I go up to them. But the fact is that this cycle continues forever. So those researchers who are in search for a temporal, linear, sufficient causality, because we have many different types of causality, but if you are in search of a cause and effect in temporal form, uh, this cause, that, or even a bunch of, you know, a lot of people in social sciences are not doing multivariate statistical analysis, and by thinking that, oh, we consider three variables, they think they have gone better, but uh, still it is causal. Then if you choose three variables and you're saying that these three variables are determining that cause, you are still in search of a linear, sufficient causal in temporal way. This happened and that happened. But, but what I'm claiming is that this strategic approach for this specific problem is wrong. We are facing an open organic feedback model. And there are two different types of general types of feedback. When I'm talking with you, when I finish, you will give me a feedback. 
you are a different system, I as a me am a different system, the feedback between us is the inter-system feedback. But the feedback between technology, which is something in the mind of a bunch of people in our society, and the society is an organic feedback. It's not an inter-system feedback. So we have to mo model it properly. And because I have this obsession with precision, I want to define the statements that I'm going to use in the proposed model. Products are the, are the things that we are producing. And unfortunately, in a lot of society and technology studies, product, technology, technique are used interchangeably, and it, it cre creates confusion, and it is misleading in the conclusions that, that people make. Hammers, laptops, databases, search engines, these are products. These are not technologies. Technology is just a, a, a nature of knowing how to do things. So we make products by applying certain technology. And, and a know-how, a, a technology, can be used to produce many different goods. So you can produce Android phone, you can create iPhone phone. With the same technology, you can also create lots of different things. Each one of these products, the technology that is being in iPod, the technology that is being used in iPhone are the same from a technological point of view. It's just they are different implementations of the same technology. There may be differences in other, you know, there may be other technological differences too, but they are fundamentally the same. So product is also different than technique, and technique is different than technology. Technique is a practical ability uh, or successfully used procedure that allows one to perform given activities. So you will be skillful or you know a technique when you know how to do a specific thing. And you don't have to do how it works. You don't have to know why a technique works. A technique is not necessarily accompanied or supported by knowing why such concrete procedures are especially uh, effective. Now, what is technology? Technology is the knowledge about an intelligent envisioned composition of artifacts, techniques, procedures, or methods. So I don't have, uh, I, I don't, uh, you know, I'm not a technologist if I know how can I, uh, you, know, uh, you know, open a car engine. If I can design an engine, then I am a technologist. I know what I'm doing. And an engine doesn't happen by accident. I cannot learn designing an engine just, just by, uh, you know, try and error. So, methods of doing things in a system that is designed with utilization of science to produce certain goods, to make specific tools, to produce certain services, and to accomplish certain tasks. So you don't mobilize a recent R&D team and a million billions of dollars of resources just by accident to create something. And the and one of the other necessary constructs is technological capital. As a society mobilizes its resources to produce uh, technological knowledge, technology, uh, I don't have to say technological knowledge because according to my definition it is knowledge, uh, this accumulation creates what we call technological capital, which is the accumulation of all of these intelligently envisioned composition of artifacts, techniques, and so forth. So a society can be um, accumulating these technological capital. Now look at this, this is, uh, look at the elements of system, and we can have hundreds of societies, uh, but in here we have two societies, society A and society B. In society A, uh, people have theoretical knowledge, society A, people have so theoretical knowledge, society B also have theoretical knowledge. They know, for example, physics. But in society A, they start to, to mobilize their resources and they develop technological capital. The know-how, which is based on the scientific knowledge that they have, and also techniques and other skills that they have. Then they mobilize it and they get money and they get the support of power elite in the society to produce specific uh, goods. So for example, these days, one of the types of technological capital that he has is information and communication technology, and a lot of resources is being invested in the development of this technology. After this technology is available, then this society may start to produce goods, products, cell phones, for example. Mm -hmm. And then when this society is producing cell phones, it has two effects in this society. One, it changes the labor relationship and other social relationships in this society. The people start to use that good 
and that could shape the social relationship and the culture and this, you know, the network of the communication in that society. However, that cell phone can be produced in another society, somewhere here. So they know the technology, they give, they give it to be produced in somewhere that they don't know the knowledge, they don't have the technology, they just know how to produce it. So producer is different than the one that has technological knowledge, and then the producer gives the goods both to society, at A, and society, B, and you're facing another level of impact, the impact of the goods, of the products and artifacts of the society. So we have you know, knowledge producing society, we have product producing society, and then we have product consuming societies, and that's the reason that I'm highlighting the importance of the differentiation between the product and technology itself. Now, because I got the signal, uh, I jump to the, to the model that I'm proposing, uh, so if you want, you can go further into the model. There, is, there are a lot of feedback loops in this system. So instead of saying, oh, this causes that, that causes this, we are actually living in a dynamic feedback system with multiple feedback loops. Here we have a feedback loop between media and culture and the collective decisions of power relations in the society. Depending to the power relations and collective decisions that the society makes, the media and the culture of the society shapes or follows the way that the power elite is directing in the collective decisions that basically the political economy is directing in. The existing media and culture of the society impacts the way that the, the, the political decisions and collective decisions are made. So even right here, you cannot say this causes that or that causes this. In a feedback loop, they are at the, an existing equilibrium. Like any, any other feedback, mm -hmm. like the thermostat of your house, it's already at 24 degrees centigrade because the engine works at, like, and then we have these two, this feedback loop determines the funding of the society, funding of the market and the rules, that determines the priorities in universities and research centers, the structure of social relations, technical codes and laws of the society, and that determines what is being investigated in natural sciences and social sciences research. That, that leads to the theories that have successful predictions, because there may be theories that don't have successful predictions. Those theories that have successful predictions, they draw the attention so then the technological research starts to use those scientific theories to create technological capital, which can be used by the intention of the developers of the technology for certain goods and services. Once those certain goods and services are created, we have positive feedback on the domain of possibilities in the society. So basically, it, how the technology and products change the society, my hypothesis is this. They do this through the change in the domain of possibilities. This positive feedback loop increases with a positive way the domain of possibilities. Domain of possibilities increases the domain of choices that the society has, which is determined in this uh, loop. And then we see that this is a, an aggressive increasing loop. And that's the reason that we see the exponential growth of technology because we observe this positive loop is here. This positive production of goods also affects the domain of possibilities of other societies. And imagine that right above that domain of possibilities of other societies is a similar huge feedback, nested feedback loops in the other society, and their products affect our society through this channel. So just imagine multiple societies, each one, the production of goods and technologies in these societies affects the other society.